All right, guys, today we're going to show Francis Ngannou some love. We've started covering the build-up of the Francis Ngannou and Anthony Joshua fight. And in the first two videos I've done, I've said that my prediction is Anthony Joshua by decision. But I think it's going to be a pretty competitive fight. But now that I'm starting to dive into the training footage, the waters are becoming a little bit murky. Because Francis Ngannou shocked us all in that Tyson Fury fight. And what I'd like to do today is just refresh our memory of how good Francis Ngannou is and how far he's come from the beginning of his MMA journey all the way through to his boxing fight versus Fury. Now, the purpose of today's video is to take a look at all of Francis Ngannou's knockouts and see what are going to be the main weapons that he will probably use against Anthony Joshua. So once again, if you like this type of content and you want to see more of it, drop a like on the video. It helps out a lot. Now, I'm going to have to chop this up a little bit just due to copyright reasons. But let's first take a look at Francis Ngannou's knockouts from when he was in the UFC. Right now, this is when Francis Ngannou first came into the UFC and he was trying truly embodying the predator look. Oh, my days. Them uppercuts and left hooks are so dangerous, and I believe that the left hook is going to be a big weapon that Ngannou can use against Anthony Joshua in this fight. Now, this is going back years ago when Ngannou was a lot more of a wild fighter. His technique is a lot better back then than it is now. Let's take a look at this combination. He throws left hook, right uppercut, left hook again, left hook again, and then throws the left and then the rear hand uppercut and then the left hand uppercut. That was really well done. It seems like a simple combination and that there's nothing crazy going on here. But what Ngannou did there is he got him used to that left hook there and then was throwing the rear hand uppercut. So it was left hook, rear uppercut, left hook, left hook, rear uppercut. And then all of a sudden, as soon as he switched that lead hand into the uppercut, that's where the opening was. But it's because he set it up with the left hook first. So some people might see this and think that he's just a big brute throwing any old combination. But the reason reason why that uppercut was available is because he set it up with the left hook. Next, we had Francis Ngannou versus Mijlovic. So once again, if we take a look at this, he throws the right hand, then left hook, and then goes left hook again. So Francis Ngannou's really confident with his power in that left hand. I mean, this isn't exactly the best heavyweight who he's fighting here. So a little bit of ground and pound, and that is the job well done. But the trends that you're going to notice as we go through this video is Francis loves that left hook. It's one of his most dangerous weapons. Next, we got Francis Ngo versus Andre Arlovsky, absolute OG of the game who needs to retire already. Oh, my days. <laughs> and that's all she wrote. Now, I'm not someone who would tell professional fighters what to do because anyone can sit here and be an armchair critic and say what a fighter should have done after the fact. And I am always the first to admit that. But obviously, looking back on this, we can notice something that Arlovsky does, which leaves him open for Francis Ngannou's right hand. If you watch Arlovsky, he throws the overhand right, he kind of leaves his head out there a little bit. Now, he did get caught on the back of his head by Ngannou's left hook. And Orlovsky is a little bit exposed here. You see where his left hand is? It's down by his hip, down by his waist. Ideally, it does need to be up by the chin. But this is something that's so hard to drill into you after years and years of letting your hands drop down. It's something that I'm trying to work on more now is getting my hands up by my face. But when you spar for so many years in a karate style with your your hands down by your side it's hard to adjust those motor patterns are drilled into you but yeah ideally that hand needs to be by Orlovsky's face because as you see Francis Ngannou that right hook all day sends Orlovsky into the shadow realm next we have one of the best or one of the worst KOs in the history of the UFC in history if you like it's Francis Ngannou versus Alistair Overeem now remember what Alistair Overeem was like when he was on the gear he was unstoppable he would walk through people but then he came off the gear and he had to adjust his style and and he obviously didn't possess the same type of power, so he turned a little bit more into a technical fighter. And we all know what happened here. Not a lot of people burning up Nick Maynard's phone to try to get a matchup with Ngannou! Goes the lead! I mean, that does not get any easier to watch. And once again, if we watch closely, what did he KO Alistair Overeem with? It was the left hand. Kind of like an uppercut. Like an uppercut hook. Yeah, an uppercut pretty much. Ouch. And I've always said Francis Ngannou, especially in the UFC, has got some of the worst technique 
with regards to punching on the whole roster. But when you're a heavyweight, six foot four, six foot five, 240 pounds, lean, being shoveling in sand mines for years, and you're just that physically imposing, you kind of don't need the technique. Obviously, he's fixed that now. You won't see Francis Ngannou throw an uppercut like this against Joshua. But look where he was throwing it from. It was literally behind his back. It was right back here. Whoa. Now, I actually think that weird angle uppercut of Francis Ngannou could be a good weapon against Joshua. Joshua's probably going to expect long punches, straight punches, and he's going to expect that left hook a lot. But if Ngannou's able to create an angle and throw that uppercut through the guard of Joshua, don't be surprised if we see Ngannou get a fourth or fifth round knockout against Anthony Joshua with a left hand uppercut. We seen him land it in the first MMA fight that we just reacted to, and then he landed it there against Overeem. So will he land it against Joshua? Next, we've got Francis Ngannou versus Curtis Blades. And there we go, speaks to himself. There was a lot more ground and pound involved in that exchange. Once again, Ngannou, very left-hand heavy. Now, I've heard a few people talking about how Anthony Joshua needs to fight on the inside against Francis Ngannou. If he can make it an inside fight, then he'll have a little bit more success as opposed to staying long on the outside because Francis Ngannou's got such a good long reach and that's where he usually gets all his knockouts. On the outside, he comes leaping in. Wow, these big punches. The only problem with that is Francis Ngannou comes from the MMA world where there's a lot of work being done on the inside and if you're a fan of MMA you will remember this knockout Francis Ngannou versus Cain Velasquez let's take a look what happened but in terms of his body he's never felt more confident in it did you even see what happened there? Now, real MMA fans will remember Kane's knee give way. But the reason why it give way is because Francis Ngannou clipped him with the tiniest, shortest uppercut ever. It was like this. Ooh. Kane Velasquez dropped, and that's where he hurt his knee. Now, could he have recovered if he didn't do his knee in? Maybe, but we'll never know. But just take a look again how short and sneaky this uppercut from Ngannou is. Right there. And then went, boom. This is where Ngannou generated all the power from to KO or TKO Cain Velasquez. And he was still able to bang KO Cain Velasquez or at least drop him. And then watch Cain's knees now, especially the way he folded over like that on that left knee. Painful, man. Painful. What a sad ending to Cain Velasquez's career. And then not to mention the fact he went to prison and all that, which he's out now, isn't he? So good on Kane. So Joshua could try and take the fight on the inside, but I don't think Ngannou will let him. The threat of the KO is going to be too big for Joshua. And even if Joshua does, Ngannou can still generate some mighty power from the inside, as we've seen there. Next, we've got the Junior Dos Santos fight. Here's what happened. Junior throws a big overhand right, gets caught with a couple left hooks, makes the mistake of tearing his back to Francis Ngannou. I think the biggest problem when you're fighting Francis Ngannou, especially in MMA, is the fear of the knockout is so big that you just make mistakes and you lunge with your punches. Junior Dos Santos is an absolute incredible boxer, one of the best boxers that the heavyweight division has ever seen. Yet, it's rare that we see him throw a punch like that at that point. He literally throws an overhand right and ends up with his head in Ngannou's crotch. We never see Junior Dos Santos throw punches like this and get out of position in the way that he did. It was almost the same punch as Andre Arlovsky and Francis Ngannou caught him with that right hand exactly the same as he did Arlovsky. And I just believe people are that worried and cautious about getting KO'd. They do things that aren't in their usual nature. They throw punches in a manner that they usually wouldn't. And I think this Junior Dos Santos fight was a prime example of that. And finally, Finally, we got Ngannou versus Rosenstrike. Now, I remember staying up till 6 a.m. to watch this fight after the night out. And here's what happened. <laughs> so violent. And let me just give props to Rosenstrike. He actually landed a couple decent shots here. Take a look at Francis Ngannou's terrible technique, which he doesn't need to fix. Because look at how much power he throws with. Watch this first overhand right that Francis Ngannou throws. He goes, body jab. <laughs> Look where Ngannou's hand is. This is obviously not great for boxing, but we won't see him do this in boxing. I'm just having a little bit of a laugh here. Rosenstrike does good at striking on the back foot. So he throws a decent left hand, actually catches Ngannou there. And then straight away off that left hook that Rosenstrike threw, he throws another inside low kick. Unfortunately, it's at the same time that Francis Ngannou starts putting on crazy pressure and throws a big left hook. I mean, look at Francis Ngannou's position here. <laughs> 
So, so sloppy, yet an absolute monster and scary mofo. Doesn't matter about how bad your technique is. If you get hit with this, you go on night-night. So obviously Francis Ngannou throws that left hook. Barely misses Rosenstrike. Then Rosenstrike catches Ngannou with a nice sneaky right hook there. Just as Francis Ngannou throws the cat punch. If you don't know what I mean, look at Francis Ngannou's right hand now. <laughs> and then this is the beginning of the end. Oh no. Night, night. Oh no. And that's just an absolute nightmare of a picture right there. Having Francis Ngannou standing over you, raining down punches like that. Then obviously, last but not least, we've got Francis Ngannou versus Tyson Fury. But Francis Ngannou, who we've seen in this fight, is a completely different fighter than the Francis Ngannou in all of them MMA fights. Look at how many times we've seen Francis Ngannou out of position, throwing hooks like this with his chest high in the air and just using all arm. Just completely relying on his size, athleticism and physicality. We didn't see any of that in this Tyson Fury fight. Yet Francis managed to, well, almost outbox Tyson Fury. And what did he catch Tyson Fury with? Let's watch. Control in the lead hand of Tyson Fury. Oh, he catches him off guard! It was that left hook. And you can go to any point in this fight and find Francis Ngannou looking for that left hook. He tries to it there you go. The right it landed right there. He went for it there, and there was many other times during this fight with Fury, he was looking for that left hook. I believe if Francis Ngannou gets this done, it's going to be by a KO with a left hook or left uppercut, and I think it'll happen in the fourth or fifth round. Now, obviously, I picked Anthony Joshua to win by decision, but I have to play devil's advocate. If Joshua wins, how do I think it's going to happen? If Francis Ngannou wins, how do I think it's going to happen? And then closer to the fight itself, I'll make a final prediction. But after watching this footage, what do you guys think? Give a more specific prediction than what you've given on my previous videos. How do you see Francis Ngannou getting this done if he can get it done against Joshua? We watched the evolution of Anthony Joshua yesterday, which you can go and watch up here after this video. And today we watched the evolution of Francis Ngannou. Unfortunately, we've only seen him box once. There's not really enough data to know what he's going to look like in this next boxing fight. We just got to look at his whole body of work and try and make the best prediction possible. So what do you guys think? Has Francis Ngannou who got a good shot of beating Anthony Joshua. Let me know in the comments down below. Make sure you all like this video. Help it get into the algorithm a bit more. If you like raw hip-hop, check my music down below. Make sure you subscribe for daily uploads. And I'll see you tomorrow.